Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Good morning, happy weekend, good afternoon for probably most of you, actually, or a lot of you. Uh, how are you guys doing today? Today we are excited to see... This is NASA's launch coverage oh. of Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich. Sorry, I'm getting some extra audio in here. Spicy. Uh, this is my. Uh, this is the launch coverage today. Okay, so I guess SpaceX is going live already, nice and early, probably because of uh, it being a, a NASA mission. Which, of course, means it's going to be in 720. Oh, that irks me. Anyway, good morning. Welcome to my live coverage of SpaceX's only, first and only launch from uh, Vandenberg this morning from California. So if you happen to live on the West Coast, small chance you might see a flamey thing flying through the sky really, 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 really fast today. So why don't we tell you guys all about this mission because it's actually, a, it's a really cool one. It's a... Yeah, it's awesome. All right, so uh, if you ever need to know anything, of course, about any upcoming rocket launches and you want to know where it's going, what what it's doing, when it launches, all that stuff, we've got you covered. Just go to everydayastronaut.com. Click on the pre-launch previews. You can see a list of upcoming missions. This one today is called Sentinel-6A. Uh, it's uh, Falcon 9 Block 5. So the liftoff time is, of course, as you can see here, about 30 minutes, T minus 30 minutes from right now, uh, which is 1717 UTC, but local standard time is 917 AM. Nice and early. So uh, mission name, this is the Sentinel 6A, Michael Freelich. Uh, I think I'm mispronouncing that. I tried to hear, listen to it quite a bit yesterday during the press conference, but uh, the first the first of two NASA slash ESA satellites that will measure sea level change. Uh, and this is kind of a follow-up to the Jason 3 satellite that launched in 2016, I believe, if I remember right, on a Falcon 9 from Vandenberg. So this is kind of a, a fun follow-up 
Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the launch provider is SpaceX. The customer, this is a NASA mission. This is a, a NASA mission with also, like, like it said, uh, ESA is a partner in this too. So this is uh, a pretty big international collaboration. The rocket is a Falcon 9 Block 5. This is 1063.1. So this is actually a brand new booster for the second. Is this the second launch in a row of a brand new booster? That's actually quite rare these days. I feel like... We are seeing way, uh, like genuinely, we're seeing way too many uh, new uh, used boosters. We're so used to seeing used boosters that it's weird to see brand new boosters like this happen too. So, yeah, so this is, so of course that, that dot one, the period after the serial number here always lets us know what flight it is. So dot one means it's its first flight. It is a brand new rocket, which again, it's just kind of weird. So um, the launch location is Space Launch Complex uh, 4E or Slick 4E as we like to call it. That's just, yeah, nice and simple. Slick uh, out at Vandenberg Air Force B uh, at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The payload mass for this thing is 1,440 kilograms, so around 3,200 pounds. The inclination, this thing's, this thing's going out into a 66 degree inclination um, at, which is at an exact altitude of 1,336 kilometers, uh, low Earth orbit. So this is quite a, if, is it going retrograde then? If it's 66 degrees, how is it doing that from Vandenberg Air Force Base without it going retrograde? Um, hmm. Let's see. I'm, I'm, anyone know? Anyone in Discord happen to know? Um, okay. So the weather is currently, uh, 80% go for launch. Uh, that's, that's great. <laughs> the, will they be attempted to recover the first stage? Yes. Where this is the fun part landing zone LZ four at Vandenberg air force base. And the landing zone is really close to the launch pad. So that's super cool. You can even, in some of the shots, you can see the launch pad right there in the background out, out at Kennedy's Kennedy space center. It's a good five to eight kilometers away, depending on which launch pad from the landing pad. I mean, it's not that it really matters because they, you know, take it down anyway and, and go and refurbish it. But it's just kind of cool that it lands so close to the launch pad. Uh, it kind of brings us into that idea of Starship, which will be at first probably landing right literally next to the launch pad. So a crane can just pick it up and put it back on the launch pad, the super heavy booster. Uh, but of course, the eventual plan is to remove the landing legs, have it land right back on the launch mounts. That's been in the design since day one. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. But this is, kind of feels a little bit like a little a teaser to that. Will they be attempting to recover the fairing? Uh, both halves of the fairings will be covered from the water by NRC Quest. So they won't be attempting to catch both of them on the West Coast since there's so few launches. They don't have uh, large the large, uh, you know, fairing catching boats out there. So probably, yeah. So this will be the first time since October 2017 that three consecutive Falcon 9s have had, have been on new boosters. What? That's a wild one. Great work with that. That's, I love that. Like I even, my mind gets blown reading my own pre-launch previews. You guys are awesome. Uh, this is the 99th Falcon 9 launch. Uh, this is the 43rd, uh, Falcon 9 block five launch, but this is the nine. How is this the 99 Falcon, 99th Falcon nine launch, but the hundredth Falcon nine mission. Oh, because of Amo six. Is that what we're doing? Amo six. I guess that's, I is, that's an interesting way of counting it, but yeah, I, I, it's true. It did not launch. It was, was it a mission if it didn't launch? Granted, it had a payload, and unfortunately, that payload was on it when it went boomy on the launch pad. Okay, interesting. Sorry. <laughs> I like that I've uh, only put it this time because it's the 100th mission. Okay. So this is the 100th and 8th SpaceX mission altogether, because don't forget, of course, Falcon 1 and Falcon Heavy make up the other eight. This will be the 66th booster landing. Holy cow. Uh, the third landing attempt on LZ-4. Uh, so really not, it's hardly ever done that. One of the times I remember uh, they had to land just offshore, uh, but basically right back at the launch site for, there was a, a couple a couple reasons. I think one of them was they didn't want um, to have it flying over another uh, payload, uh, another rocket that was sitting out on the pad, um, a Falcon or a Delta IV Heavy. So I, yeah, 
Uh, okay, so this is the this if if this lands today, it's the sixteenth consecutive landing. They're making it look just absolutely easy peasy now. Twenty second SpaceX launch of twenty twenty, new record for the most SpaceX launches in a year, and there's still more to come. Sixteenth SpaceX launch from Slick for, for from Slick Four E. Uh, this is a five hundred twenty eight day turnaround. That's how long it's been since we saw a last Slick Four E launch. The forty second Falcon Nine launch with the old strong back design. It's so weird. Yeah, you're going to see this is different. Um, the seeing launches from Slick 4E is different than the East Coast because of the old strong back. It like retracts to 13 degrees and hangs out there for a long time. <laughs> uh, and then uh, this is the 95th orbital launch attempt of 2020 in the world. Uh, man, Trevor, you are killing it with these with these awesome stats. I love this. Each, each time I'm like I'm just surprised at some stat here. Super fun to see. That is so awesome. So, uh, yeah, if you guys want to read more about all of the stuff uh, and you kind of get a, a rundown on the rocket and on all that stuff, go ahead and check that out. Everyone say thank you to Ethan for uh, for writing up this particular pre-launch preview uh, and say thank you quick to the to the everything. I mean, say thank you to our mods and our, our website crew. You guys are awesome. That is awesome. So how are you guys today? Hopefully you guys are good. I'm going to kind of have uh the launch pulled up and ready to go once once we get a little bit closer i do have the um the live audio pulled up so we should catch some of the the polling stuff here um in the background but i'll, I'll let you guys know if i hear anything on my end uh yeah thank you guys for tuning in this morning let's see here uh of course musical wolves is in here this morning uh from of course from yellowstone national park thank you so much musical wolves you are awesome always appreciate you saying hi and uh andrew tyrer uh, a new member that's going to confuse me because our producer is andrew <laughs> andrew taylor so i was like andrew why did you become a member thank you very much andrew i appreciate that uh musical wolves are o-rings present and too cold launch if yes so o-rings were really primarily uh, a concern on the space shuttles a particular design that held the pressure in between the segments of the solid rocket boosters on the space shuttle so the space shuttle uh, as you recall you know obviously had large the large srbs and that was that was basically put up of uh, there was an, a skirt an, an aft nozzle and then five segments of solid rocket propellant and then a nose so those five segments of rock, solid rocket propellant where they were joined together uh, they were mechanically joined you know with like a basically a giant like pipe clamp essentially but then in between there to, to keep the hot you know the high pressure gases from escaping there were literally like rubber type o-rings that would seal that together um, to make sure that seal stayed nice and sturdy. Um, that was, a, I mean, there's O-rings on our cars. I mean, there's O-rings on everything. Your car doesn't, you know, uh, blow up when it gets below freezing. Um, so there are, of course, some O-rings on this vehicle, uh, but they don't, they don't, they don't serve the same purpose as the solid rocket boosters uh, of the space shuttle. And so, so yeah, so cold weather is not nearly as big of a factor for the Falcon Nine uh, for that reason. Uh, and they also, you know, uh, Morton Thiokol ended up kind of being able to fix, for the most part, some of those concerns and address those concerns by adding a third O-ring to the, the Space Shuttle solid rocket booster. So um, it's not a concern that I know of. And I don't know what the minimum operating temperature is of the Falcon 9, but uh, but the having an O-ring like that isn't the same concern. Um, I just want to have, I'm actually going to kind of pull this up. They're showing a little bit about what this, the Sentinel uh, 6A satellite will look like. One of the cool things about this, guys, it will be measuring, uh, it can measure the oceans. Oh, that's, that looks like JPL. Um, I can measure the, the ocean's uh, exact height to millimeter accuracy and cover something like 99% of the ocean. Uh, so this is pretty important, you know, of course, for those people that want to, that are studying climate change and and all of those effects of everything, the only thing, you, the only way you can ever, you know, uh, learn more and and confirm your models or or change your hypothesis or make a whole new uh, hypothesis in the first place or a new theory is is with good data, right? Good data is the the root of all of that, right? So. Obviously, uh, you know, if we're to be studying climate change and making appropriate actions, uh, either more drastic actions or potentially like, oh, actually, we realize through more modeling and through more data, maybe we realize that, oh, this is actually a natural phenomenon. We just have to hang in there and, and 
and ride this one out or something, you know. But that's that's the beauty of data collection. That's also the beauty of studying other planets. When we have other planets, we we broaden our model of data and how we can compare that to Earth. So we can say, oh, we now know that when X amount of you know, sunlight hits X type of spot under a certain type of gas and this concentration, it does this. And we can add that kind of to a whole model, which is interesting because it's, it's really interesting to me that you can learn a lot about the planet we live on by visiting other bodies, by visiting comets and asteroids, because we just kind of get a greater sense of how all the stuff works on our own planet. So yeah, just kind of a fun little reminder of, of what this all is, how it's working. I, and I totally bonked my overlay. There we go. We'll just have this up here. Um, yeah, so this this launch today, by the way, guys, is, is dedicated to uh, Michael Freelich, uh, who was a, a, a NASA, someone involved in a, a lot of these missions, uh, Jason 3 and all the stuff leading up to this. So um, this, this is pretty cool that they have a whole launch dedicated to him too. So that's pretty awesome. Um, musical wolf says my 1600 millimeter lens is good for wildlife and some close-ups of the moon. Uh, not much anything else. Oh, sorry. I don't have it here on screen. Uh, can you compare camera millimeter to telescope measurement? Absolutely. Yep. So you can still, um, so for instance, we were using a 2000 millimeter telescope, uh, and Cos cosmic perspective uses a 2000 millimeter telescope when we, um, are doing all that stuff out at the Cape. So of course you're, you know, you still have an effective focal length depending on which camera, which sensor you have. Um, but it's, it's the, the actual, you know, the glass in front of it, the magnification is the same, no matter what sensors there, it's just depending on that kind of changes how much, you know, crop factor there is on top of that. Um, so yes, it, it actually directly correlates um, so yeah, if, you, if you're looking to get even re more ridiculous, you can, you can always grab a telescope and use that as, as glass for, for photography, for, uh, for videos, all that stuff. But one thing to remember a lot of times, most telescopes, uh, if it's a, uh, what's that called where it has the diffraction or whatever, and it has like a thing in the middle, you might actually get some weird bokeh or bokeh, however you say it. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> Why not 42,069 millimeters? <laughs> Come on, catnip kingpin. <laughs> um, oh, I should mention, by the way, the last time they launched Jason 3 was the one that that it was supposed to, it was hopefully going to be the first Falcon 9 to land on the drone ship. Um, and it, it was a Vandenberg launch and it, it landed. It literally looked like a perfect landing, but one of the sol or one of the landing legs didn't lock in place. So that was a, a total heartbreak. I was watching that live. I don't remember. I don't think we had live footage from the deck of that because I think that was too early on. But we uh, we saw. Uh, I think Elon shared something on Twitter like almost immediately after saying like, "Well, it landed this time, but the one of the legs didn't lock or whatever, and and it fell over." So uh, it was it was a total roller coaster of a ride. I remember that really, really, really good. Uh, Michael Curtis. Uh, watch you since b a pressure suit days. Wow. You just get better and better. Well done, Tim. Well, thank you, Michael. You've been around for a while. If you've, if you were around for the, the space suit, you're already OG. There's some people out there that are, that were Instagram followers before I, I ever did anything on YouTube, which is crazy to me that you guys have been around that long. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for the new membership. Uh, Sean, thank you so much for the new membership and Patrick. Thank you for the new membership as well. You guys are awesome. Uh, I can't wait. Um, I cannot like at all wait to be able to get down to uh, Texas still, hopefully relatively soon. Just waiting <laughs> for, like to be able to hit the road, get down there and uh, and basically self isolate, but uh, but get lots and lots and lots of Starship content out for you guys, including serial number eight. Uh, obviously, <laughs> hopefully that flight, that would be really, really cool. Uh, Chase, why do they fly from Vandenberg and not Florida? So this is actually a good question. Now, normally it used to be a really, a really simple question to answer because, uh, from Vandenberg where, where they're launching from in California, let me do this your way. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, the coast of California kind of juts in, they can launch straight South from that point in California and not fly over any land. That's the thing that people need to remember about rockets is they're still, very explodey and have the potential to rain debris and massive amounts of propellant and toxic fumes and explosive materials 
on to the anything in its path potentially so um that's why rockets still always take off at least in the united states they take off from the coast so the so for launches that are heading east into low earth orbit geostationary orbit those types of orbits um those will all be done from florida uh you can you can go anywhere from 28 degrees straight out up to about 55 degrees northeast before you start to fly over you know new york and virginia and all that stuff um, but on, on Van from Vandenberg, you can fly straight South or anywhere retrograde too. And, uh, that way you're not overflying any populated land. You're not flying over any populated areas. So normally when you're flying a polar orbit, you know, that a polar orbit or some kind of, uh, you know, orbit in that orientation, you do it from Vandenberg, but they did something different this year when, when, what was that? Uh, I'm already forgetting, uh, something B. Something, something B. I already forgot what mission that was. Salcom, Salcom B. Was that right? Or Salcom A? Salcom B. Uh, launched from Florida and they actually did a dog leg maneuver so it doesn't f- overfly any like big parts of. Um, yeah, it was, it was Salcom. Um, so it didn't overfly Cuba basically. So uh, 1B. There we go. Salcom 1B. Thank you guys. So that was, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy to me that that they were able to do that. And that was the first time they've done a polar orbit from Florida in like 50 years, basically. So um, that is a possibility when there's performance available to do that. I don't see why they probably won't do that more often in the future. You know, uh, launching from Vandenberg requires a little bit more refurbishment, requires a team that's obviously not as well oiled as the team out at Kennedy Space Center at at Cape Canaveral. Because think about how often Cape Canaveral is launching. I mean, they... They know that launch pad in and out. As soon as the rocket launches, they're just like, all right, do the thing that we do literally basically every week at this point or every two weeks. Um, and obviously, like we said in our pre-launch preview, it's been 500 some days since they last launched from Vandenberg. So the team's just not, you know, definitely doesn't get as much action. Um, but yeah, we, uh, yeah. So that's just kind of how that normally works. I, I don't exactly know the exact reasons when and why, Uh I'm guessing though, is if this was 60 degrees, is this did, did we get that answer? Does this actually fly retrograde? Because if it flies retrograde, you definitely do have to launch from Vandenberg. You do not have an, a retrograde option from Florida. So um, retrograde is flying away from uh, check. It does not fly retrograde. Oh wow, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it actually flies down. Basically, following the the uh, Baja of Mexico or whatever, Baja California. What is that thing called? The little dingle there. <laughs> Sixty six is basically right down the coast. So this will be a, a great launch if you live in California. You, I mean, it's it's basically uh, the Baja Peninsula. Thank you. <laughs> That's what it's called. You know that thing, the the little dangler. Um, yeah. So that's pretty cool. Um, but, but it is Baja, California. Okay. Okay. I wasn't totally wrong. <laughs> this is from uh, Marwin. Uh, have you seen the new Flight Club design? I've seen lots of stuff from Flight Club, obviously. Uh, I don't know if I've noticed a new design. I mean, he keeps adding stuff. Um, I don't I don't know if I've seen anything new. I'll have to check that out because we, we use Declan's uh, from Flight Club. Uh, we use his, his data in the background to power our simulated telemetry that you guys will see that we'll, we'll use on first stage. So um, that's pretty cool. All right, this is um, from Zora. Zora Sapphire says, what kind of operational differences are there between West Coast and East Coast launches? Um, elementary versions. So yeah, sorry, actually, I, I kind of did just answer that, but it's still a good question. Um, you know, the main, the main reason you'd launch from one or the other is based on where your orbit is. Uh, and, and which direction you can fly. Um, let me actually real quick pull up. Um, just give me one second. I'm going to pull up flight club and we will check this mission out. Um, and I'll show you guys the actual mission so we can kind of get a sense of where it's flying. Um, Sentinel six run simulation. Okay. I'll give you guys a, a little bit. Here we go. So this is flight and, uh, we'll be able to see where it's flying over. So uh, with the 3D visualization up here, I love this. Look at all this data that that comes up. How awesome is that? So the 3D visualization here. And uh, you'll notice it actually flies. This is where we're talking about it. It's going to fly right parallel to the coast of California, which ends about here or so. 
So San Diego is, you know, going to be right around here or something. I, I might be a little off, but, or maybe it's down here. I can't really tell without, <laughs> uh, well, maybe that's, maybe that's San Diego. I don't know. Either that or that's San Diego. Either that, that looks like San Diego. <laughs> okay. Anyway, this is called Maps with Tim Dodd. Uh, and then up here is LA. So if you live out there, now notice it, it does slightly overfly. It kind of shoots between these two islands, it looks like. But I, I think, how, I wonder what they do there. I wonder how they avoid people being on, on that island. But anyway, um, yeah, so this is, this is the flight path. Now you'll notice if you're flying out of Vandenberg from here, you have the option to fly apparently 60 degrees all the way retrograde if you want. But if you fly straight down, um, or you have to factor the rotation of the earth a little bit, like so it's like an 85 degree or 95 degree or something, um, in order to cancel out and, and be completely straight up and down 90 degrees, uh, you'd obviously want to launch from Vandenberg. And now that's not the case with Florida. Um, Florida, obviously, here's Cape Canaveral um, right here in the right in this little thing. And like I said, they can fly 28 degrees. I mean, they can, of course, fly south. Um, but to get into uh, an orbit, 99% um, of the time, you're flying either parallel to your latitude or northeast um, at an increased latitude. So uh, like I said, they can go about 60 degrees north here from, from Florida. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how that works. Pretty cool visualization, of course. And so this, this kind of shows exactly where it's going to end up. Um, you will notice that it, it kind of does this thing here where it looks really confusing. That's because of this accounts for, this is basically following the ground track of the Earth. So by the time this orbit comes around, the Earth will have spun this much, basically, uh, and it would continue to do that. So if, you, if you're to bind it to the Earth, you're always going to see it kind of doing this like crisscross thing. That's why if you ever see those projection maps, you'll notice that the orbits look like a wave, and then there's another wave following it, and then another wave following that. Um, it's because it's following the ground track of the Earth, and not in real life, you know, an orbit just sticks there, and the Earth is spinning underneath it. So it's just kind of kind of confusing, just kind of, yeah. There you go. Uh, that's, that's Declan Murphy there. Um, so, oh, Jesse's out there. Um, Let's see. I'm right square on. <laughs> Let's see what we can learn here. Um, to gain altitude, and actually does kind of like a backflip, um, and then we have three burns that it does. So when it's doing that backflip, it does the boost back burn, which is three of the nine Merlin One uh, engines uh, re reigniting, um, and then following the boost back burn, it will do an entry burn to help slow it down uh, as it enters back into the Earth's atmosphere, and then it comes back down and lands with just one single engine for the final landing burn. It is the neatest <laughs> thing to see in person, and it is loud. There's big size. So boom. Oh, yeah. You mm -hmm. have to even like warn the local residents that it's happening. Oh yeah. <laughs> we want to actually share a special question with you right now. There is a, a young man. So look at how eight year old named. Look at how gorgeous this. Uh, you know the coast of Vandenberg there is so beautiful. I've not seen a launch from Van. No, I have technically seen a launch from Vandenberg, but not really. It was OG two, uh, which is an, another uh, Earth like an orbiting observatory as well, an Earth observation satellite uh, satellite in 2014, I think. And uh, it was so foggy. It was at like 2 a.m. in the middle of the night or something. It was super foggy. All you could see is that it just kind of got a little bit brighter. And even though we were at the press site only five kilometers away, three miles away, absolute fog city. It was Foggenberg for that day for sure. Uh, this is a good question here from uh, Vort Gaunt. Uh, will you cover in, uh, in development engines for Angara and, and the Cyclone 5 in Soviet engine video? So... Um, for Angara, those aren't development engines. Those are the RD-191s. Um, and on Angara, we talk about that because that, it shares a lot of commonality with the RD-181, which is what the Antares use. They're basically this, the same thing with a little bit orientation differences and things like that. Um, but as far as for the uh, for the Cyclone 5, we, we just kind of talk about it a little bit. Um, I think the one that's probably more interesting that that we talk a little... So Cyclone, Cy, the Cyclone 5 is kind of... Uh, based on uh, on some uh, kind of a whole smorgasbord of things. I, I, I touch on it really quick, and then I really quickly also touch on the methane engines that might power uh, Soyuz 5. So we'll see. <laughs> we will see. Uh, so yeah, I don't get too much into the in-development stuff, but just kind of touch on it really quickly. So um, yeah. Um, Irish, Irish Saber, thank you so much. Uh, hi, Astronaut Chill, Astronaut Badge, Astronaut Badge. Thank you so much. I, I wonder what that actually looks like because that probably looks a lot different in the super chats. 
<laughs> All right, um, Alex Garth, um, Shiba Dog doing in a combat position. Thank you so much. Same type of thing where it just is weird to read out loud, but I appreciate it. Um, this is Musical Wolves again. Do cell phones in space get zero zero G signal instead of five G? Yeah, I mean, obviously, this a standard cell phone is uh, the the receivers or the transmitters are pointing primarily downward to service the people sitting on the ground. You know, these are on on water towers, things that you see, you know, in your local environment, you're going to be seeing cell phone towers. That's why you, you rarely get any or if any cell phone service, even, you know, if you're if you're very naughty and you're on an airplane, you'll notice your signal go away relatively quickly in a couple minutes. Um, by the time you reach, I don't know, a couple thousand meters or something, it, it's gone. So, yeah, so in space without something like Starlink, uh, there's really absolutely zero cell phone service. So yeah, you get, but I also did just realize you get zero G. Oh my gosh, I did. I answered it. I answered it. I answered the whole thing. I answered that whole thing, and then realized <laughs> zero G. Oh my gosh. Oh man, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's bad. Hey Andrew, we got to do a little clock tweaking there. We got to do a little clock t tweaking. That's funny. Got me. You got me. Okay, so uh, we should point out here real quick that, okay, so the strong back is beginning to retract. They retract it here at Vandenberg um, at three, T minus three minutes. This is an old strong back design. It won't fall back um, like they have at 39A and Slick 40 um, in uh, at Kennedy Space Center. So you'll notice it retracts to, uh, I believe it's 13 degrees. And uh, that the funny thing is, I remember the first time I watched, I believe it was CRS-10 was the first mission from 39A, the first time we saw the, the strong back, and it the one that actually, the new one, and it just falls back, and I remember going, oh, like, it just looks wrong, <laughs> it looks, you know, because we were so used to that before that point, and that was, I believe, in 2017, um, was the first time they used that, so that was a really, it was a scary thing, because we were so used to the strong back just just staying there like this. So now this looks foreign. This looks weird now. I haven't seen this in a long time. Uh, the, someone uh, in Discord, someone asking, why haven't they updated this? Well, as you can tell, the, the pad doesn't get that much use. It's been 500 days. Uh, the, the new strong back design helps refurbishment because it kind of keeps, it gets a lot of the stuff away from the really flamey end uh, really quickly. And so, it, you know, it, it obviously helps to reduce refurbishment time. And uh, so, but if this pad's not getting that much use, it's probably just not worth it. Uh, but speaking of flamey, we do need to point out that the pointy end is up and the flamey end is down. This is an excellent view of that exact thing. I'm even wearing the right shirt for it today, guys. I am wearing the pointy end up, flamey end down shirt. Yes, it is. It is time, my friends. It is time. And and just a reminder too, uh, whatever shirt I'm wearing on on stream is 10% off today. So if you want to get your own pointy end up, flamey end down t-shirt, uh, head on over to shop.everydayastronaut.com. Again, that's shop.everydayastronaut.com or everydayastronaut.com slash shop, however you want to do it, whatever. It all goes to the same place. Uh, yeah, and you can grab one of those and that helps support me and continue to do what I do and get my butt down to Texas and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, so we're, so just a friendly reminder too, at this, at this moment, you're seeing what looks like smoke and, and stuff. Those are, uh, you're even actually seeing some of the, the purging right now of the liquid oxygen. So um, as, as it turns into gaseous oxygen. So, so inside of that tank, inside the upper stage and inside the first stage, there's liquid oxygen and liquid oxygen. Uh, SpaceX chills down to minus 207 degrees Celsius. Uh, so very, very cold. And of course, as it comes into contact with the humidity, uh, so on the side of the tank, you'll see, uh, the, you know, the humid air coming in contact with that uh, turns it into uh, st uh, clouds like that, condensation clouds. Um, that's a perfect shot right there of that. But then you'll notice a, a lot more venting out right now. That's because once it's it's totally fueled up uh, and ready to go, uh, they are kind of bleeding out the lines, and that's just gaseous um, oxygen now that, that, as it gets vented out, turns into a gas, expands a thousand times when it does so, and of course, comes in contact with the air. So let's listen in here for the last T minus one minute. Listen in these last minute and just enjoy the countdown. Yeah, baby. Falcon 9 is in startup. Launch director is go for launch and landing.
you may notice some water beginning to flood the pad here. That's very intentional. Uh, that's actually a sound suppression system that, that occurs to allow uh, the, the sound of the, vibra the vibration of the sound to actually be suppressed. And it also helps with some cooling as well. Falcon 9 is configured for flight. T minus 15. Let's Ten. see it, baby. Nine. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Zero. And liftoff of Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich, continuing a legacy of ocean observation and international collaboration to benefit all humanity. Let's hear that audio, baby. That's a cool shot. And one propulsion is nominal. Good. They did have to swap out some of the engines on this. Oh, here it comes. Look at that. Oh, yeah. All right, telemetry nominal. So again, if you live in uh, California, go outside, peek outside. You'll be able to start seeing it. If, if you live in LA, look northwest. In San Diego, look northwest. It'll start pitching over now and start heading south or southeast even. So kind of looks like it'll be flying kind of over the horizon for you guys. So we're following the horizon. Vehicle is experiencing maximum aerodynamic pressure. There we go, max Q. So there we heard that call for max Q. We also heard vehicle is supersonic, meaning it's traveling faster than the speed of sound. A beautiful shot there from the first stage looking down towards Earth and seeing the, the plume there created by those nine Merlin 1D engines. Yeah, we had some questions about the roll, the, the roll to uh, maneuver. The Falcon 9 doesn't actually need to roll to align for its telemetry. Uh, it does it more for the fairings and for payload considerations, really. Um, and also, when they do stage separation, they want those two gas thrusters on the sides uh, parallel to the ground so that both of them can help in the flip maneuver. So, um, yeah, so that's if you have any questions about why a cylindrical rocket needs to roll, I did a really deep dive on that called. Uh, why do cylindrical rockets roll? Uh, it's one that I learned a ton on. About Beautiful clear skies there from Vandenberg yeah. on the ground. Able to track with that rocket as you see it on screen now. But definitely watch it. That's just one of those where I learned a ton. All right, here we go. Here. Booster, or first stage engine cutoff. Stage separation confirmed. Booster separation is there visible on screen now. Beautiful shot. Yes. I love that. There's the backflip, as Jesse mentioned, beginning with the, the Falcon booster. Stage one, boost that burner started. That's an awesome shot. Beautiful. And that second engine looks like it has lit. You can start to see the engine bell there turning uh, an Both orange. Both vehicles are following nominal trajectory. Fairing separation confirmed. Yes. And there goes the fairing. That's exposed. That is Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich there on your screen. That is the satellite that has been exposed now because the fairings have been jettisoned and separated. And you just saw it there tumbling away. Some beautiful shots on the way to orbit. So guys, watch the stage one telemetry. I, uh, I have that on the left right now. I probably should have switched them over. Or it's on the right. So simulated stage one telemetry. Notice that it's still going up. The first stage is still going up, but it's canceling out its velocity. Now it's not going to hit zero velocity because it's all relative. So because, because it's moving, right? It's still, even if it's moving up or moving sideways or backwards, um, at any point in that it's still moving. So it's, it's a relative velocity compared to a null point on earth. Um, so you'll notice now that it's uh, the the velocity is dropping because it's coasting up still, but it's now coasting up back to the launch pad. So it will never zero out its velocity. It will zero out its vertical velocity, and then its vertical velocity will, will increase. But you'll notice that it already still has you know a substantial amount of boost back burn. So it actually went backwards back to the launch pad. And this is a very light payload, so. It probably was a really easy boost back burn. It really didn't need to do too much. But um, we're seeing here, of course, you're seeing the, the grid fins are already out, even though, of course, the, the booster is well above the Carmen line, well into the vacuum of space. Uh, those grid fins 
uh, are currently not doing anything, but they are fully deployed. Of course, they don't have anything to to work against. The Griffins don't really start doing much until after the uh, until after the boost or the re-entry burn, which we'll see here in a little bit of time. So notice that the the first stage is now falling. It has hit peak apogee. And the second stage continues to speed up because, of course, you know, getting into orbital velocity uh, in order to go to space, you go just you can go straight up and then you're in space. But if you just go straight up, you're going to fall straight back down. So the second stage has to be going sideways really, really, really fast. And the first stage helps aid in that a good amount of normally about a quarter of velocity uh, is put in is injected by the first stage. That's why it pitches over. And then now once it lets go of the second stage, the second stage does the rest of the work. The second stage actually does the most amount of energy. Um, because it, that's just how it works, you know, uh, but the first stage now is, uh, is, is just coming right back down. So, um, sorry, I'm going to see where I can put the telemetry now that isn't covering up that shot. Um, we will come back and t chat more in a bit. Uh, well, again, we'll revisit you once we get towards that second stage, second burn. Uh, but for now, I think we're ready to head back out to, to check in with Daryl uh, and Jesse to hopefully enjoy what I would expect to be a beautiful, awesome. uh, very noisy uh, nominal landing of that booster. Uh, Daryl, how was launch? How did it look out there? <laughs> All right, we're going to hang off. They're not quite ready yet. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they're just enjoying it. They probably got up uh, to watch that launch, and they're probably getting positioned again. So uh, I don't blame them. Uh, Me neither. <laughs> yeah, they should definitely soak it in. <laughs> that was great. All right, so we're coming up here. Boost back burn is probably going to be beginning pretty soon here. Or the re-entry burn. Sorry, the re-entry burn. <laughs> I'm going to move this back up. That... Looks weird to me. So that uh, second stage uh, Merlin vacuum engine, uh, M MVAC as we like to call it, uh, that produces around 210,000 pounds of thrust once it's on orbit uh, in the vacuum of space. Hey, on, entry burn has started. All right, so call for the entry burn there. I think Daryl and Marina are ready for us. They should be there with Jesse to talk us through the landing. Uh, how was launch? <laughs> Oh. oh my goodness. It was incredible. <laughs> it was incredible. <laughs> That's it why was we're late. We're all, we're, I'm was, <laughs> we're, just we're all talking at the same time. It's great. <laughs> I mean, can, can you tell that we were excited? We were standing oh, there. We saw it. It was so clear we could see the separation as it was going the entire time. Jesse, I mean, sit down. Aw, inspiring. My mind is blown. Oh, <laughs> so it's going to be landing right behind us, mm -hmm. and we've got a view now of the actual booster coming back. Um, it's got its grid fins out. Notice how much it's slowing down just from the atmosphere. No, notice it's slowing down like crazy because the atmospheric drag is just like slamming on the brakes. It's the steering mechanism. It's, it's really interesting that it lands right next to the launch pad. We have a little tent over top of us, so we're not going to see that first boost back. Burn, but we have a clear shot of uh, it coming down onto the pad. The other thing we're wait, uh, waiting for, and we're making sure that we keep track of, is the engine cutoff of stage um, stage two. And we're gonna call that out. Here it comes. There it is! Oh my goodness. Coming in at an angle, and just straightening out. What do you think, Jesse? That's got to amazing. See too many. Oh my goodness, I might cry right now. <laughs> so incredible. Every time I see this, it's just slowing down so perfectly. Look Perfect. Out. Just hovering. Oh. There's the sonic booms we talked about and touchdown. Oh my we heard God. that. Oh, we heard that. that was yes. And Falcon uh, 9 has landed at LZ4, landing operator to 11.100 yes. on recovery to... I'm a little teary right now. Oh, the, the, the that power. was awesome! You see it here in person oh. to feel it. Oh. And like Jesse said, no matter if you see it or not, you always hear it, yeah. right? So that yes. sonic boom is recognizable wherever you are. And reverberating through yeah. the valley oh, here. I know. I <laughs> well, what'd you think, Jesse? Oh, I, I have no words. That was incredible. Like. As, as many launches as I've seen, seeing it in person is a whole different experience. <laughs> the, crowd, the crowd that's with us, you can hear you them can cheering hear them and everything. Cheering. They're just Everybody's totally so like, excited. you know, in, in awe. That's fun. <laughs> We're so glad that uh, we could do this and uh, have you join us with this. Jesse Anderson from SpaceX, Thanks. lead manufacturing engineer. Thanks so much for coming out here. What a moment. Thanks so much for having me. That's awesome. 
Thank you. Absolutely. That's so cool that Jesse actually got to see one in person. I feel like that's actually not very normal to be able to do that for her. So we're going to we we'll kind of have this. Yeah, so we're pretty much done. But in the meantime, we'd like to tell you about the science behind the Sentinel-6. Okay, so we can watch that anytime because uh, there's some – NASA already posted a ton of awesome videos all about this mission. Um, so let me answer some more of you guys' questions. But first off, how awesome was that landing? That was one of the best landings I've seen. It was really fun uh, knowing that they're right there, hearing their reactions to it. I feel like you guys don't always get to hear that. Seeing a rocket launch and landing in person is one of the coolest things you can – ever experienced in my opinion i mean it's it's incredible uh i'm i'm just glad we're living in this era where you can go and see them more often you know for me it's a two-day drive when i do that you know of course it's only like a six-hour flight or whatever um but you know it's it's still a, a journey for me to be able to go out to see any launch so i totally understand uh people that you know internationally how hard it can be to view a launch but it but if you have the option of doing it it is worth it um yeah, I would definitely get your butts out there if you can. Uh, it's it's well worth it. Maybe you know, but the thing, my my tip is let's let's definitely wait um, until, of course, the pandemic is settled down before we can you know all travel from all around the world. But also definitely aim for something like a Starlink mission. Um, and the good thing about Starlink missions is they're basically almost every two weeks now. So if you can give yourself two weeks of time at Florida, you're almost assured to see a launch these days, which is really exciting. That was not the case when I started going out to the Cape in 2014. It was like the it was the hardest thing to catch a launch. I would have to go out there and wait for weeks and stuff was scrubbing constantly. So um, let's see. So uh, people are asking good question. The legacy in our discord. A lot of people are asking about the lack of official telemetry. Is this a classified payload? No, it's not. Unless they don't want countries uh, to determine its orbit. No, because they've published the orbit. It's 60 degrees, 1,336 kilometers. It's just because it was a NASA stream. NASA stream doesn't ingest the data, the, the telemetry. That's why we were able to pull up uh, the flight club data there for you guys. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Vandenberg is super cool, though. Notice in the background, you see all these different launch pads and stuff. Vandenberg is super, super cool. But, uh, but yeah, that's that's why that happened there so um let's see <laughs> um the youtube okay so sup mate says uh can you fast forward the youtube stream setting the play to 1.25 will decrease the delay well the problem is when you're watching me it has to come to me first and then get republished on youtube so if you do care about those seven or eight seconds your best just to have it pulled up somewhere else uh because there will always be a delay between what i see and me ingesting it up to you guys Hmm. The, <laughs> she's just on on air. Does they not? Are they not able to communicate that she's on air? Oh. Huh. Well. Yeah, they don't hear that. So, <laughs> um, Galadex says. Uh, we are at our first in-person launch at Vandenberg. Excited to be here. Thanks for all your videos. This message was funded by my sister. That's super cool. Congrats, Galadex. Hopefully you caught it. It looked like a beautiful day. Again, most launches from Vandenberg that I've seen are, are like that I've even watched online. And the one that I saw in person was not beautiful. That was stunning. That looked like the nicest day ever. So very, very cool. Um, Space time. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to announce I'm pursuing aerospace engineering from next year. I'm going to help humanity take it this next giant leap. That's what I like to hear. That is super, super cool. Congratulations on uh, on on wanting to pursue a career. I mean, that's think about how how massive that is. You know, just the the fact that that you want to actually go into aerospace now. I mean, that's huge. I feel like that wasn't. I don't know. I, I mean, I, just ugh, that just makes me excited. That there's people out there literally changing their careers and changing their studies and stuff to become aerospace engineers now. That is awesome. Um, this is from um. Uh, Irie Live, thank you so much for the membership. Um, and this is from Chris uh, Kipolas saying, thanks for doing these. You're welcome. My pleasure. Uh, we also have a new member from Leo, a new member from Steven, uh, Jason S. Um, watching with my twin nine-year-old daughters this afternoon. Thanks for bringing the love of space to the masses. That's awesome. Thank you for, again, I love when there's families watching together, watching a rocket launch. Like that is to me so cool. 
Uh, that is the world I want to live in where families are gathered around a TV watching rocket launches together. That's super awesome. So thank you for, for doing that. And hello to your family. Hi guys. Uh, Sam Dillon. Hey Tim, have you contracted, uh, contacted SpaceX to have your music on the live stream? Would have been great to hear your music during the cruise stream last week. So, uh, I, I mentioned this real quick the other day, um, that I, I mean, they, so the music that they have on air is always with test shot starfish. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. Uh, it is uh, a really cool uh, artist that that does, they do all the production too, but they also do um, all the music on the live streams. And so I haven't ever done something with SpaceX, but what I have done, my friends, I have done something that's kind of secret. And the last time I did this, it, it, uh, it, was, it was too quiet, but um, I have actually done a collaboration that is hopefully coming out here uh, this, wait, in December, I think, November, December. Um, I'll give you guys a little teaser of that. Last time I did it, it was super quiet, but um, this is uh, a collaboration, a little sneak peek of a collaboration that I'm doing with Test Shot Starfish, which again is the official, the, the people that do the official SpaceX music. So maybe this will end up in a, in a stream at some point, but I don't know. But here's, here's what I laid down. Let me know if it's too quiet. I will start playing it here in one second. Um, I'll, I'll bump it up in here just so you guys have enough. Uh, headroom, but we'll see if it's loud enough. Right, it's not even showing up. <laughs> Crap. Well, just pretend that you hear it. Yeah, it's not even showing up now. That's weird. You guys couldn't hear that, right? Yeah, you guys couldn't hear it. That's weird. Why is it not naughty? Naughty, naughty, naughty desktop audio. Eh. Oh well, we tried. <laughs> you have to, you have to wait. I guess that was just a tease of the, you. You could recreate the wavelengths there if you guys have, uh, you know, a little thing. Just re take the wavelengths, paste it into your own uh, DAW, and then just recreate it. You'll know what it sounds like then, or or wait a little bit. <laughs> yeah, just look at the waveforms. Do it in your head. I didn't say I was going to give you a, an audio sneak peek. I was promising to give you guys something. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be the dumbest thing ever. There you go. You guys can look at the wavelengths, and I expect you to <laughs> hear how good it sounds yourselves. Oh, no. That is not the case. Okay, so um, let's see here. Let's keep answering some questions from you guys. Uh, we have a new member. Oh, so yeah, so Sam, stay tuned. Hopefully, you'll hear that relatively soon. Benjamin Mercier, thank you so much for the membership. Uh, Zach B., Tim, why do you believe this year has had the highest failure rates for launches in decades? I believe since the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. Really? I I haven't heard that yet. I would have to... Ver Is that true? I would have to have that verified. Um, does anyone know for sure? <laughs> if, if that's the case... I mean, just statistical anomalies. I guess we also have a lot of startups. Don't forget, there's a lot of... Like, right now we have... You know, think about two of the failures that I can think of off the top of my head were Astra and Virgin Orbit. So right there, you have two attempts for the first time going to orbit. Of course, you're going to see failures, you know. Um, and then, of course, you know, yeah, China had a failed one. Astra failed. Rocket Lab had a failure this year. I mean, there's a, a good amount of failures, but there's also a good amount of brand new. Uh, yeah, Ariane. Wait, did Ariane fail or was it Vega? Yeah, Vega. Two Vega failures. Was the other Vega this year or was that last year? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just probably because there's so many new, uh, you know, new rockets coming online. That's that's really interesting. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's keep going here. Coley, uh, will you consider a run of everyday astronaut pajamas? I actually do someday want to like recreate my spacesuit as as PJs. I think that'd be super fun. Uh, so maybe, maybe we find a, a good vendor to to produce something that would actually be worth it. We'll consider that. Hi, Tim, and thanks for all the impressive work you're doing for the space for space fan community. Any plans on covering um, Angara A5 rocket test launch on November 28th? Depending on where I am, I would actually really like to cover that. Now that I actually know a little bit about that rocket. Yeah, that would be, uh, that'd be really, really fun. So, um, Oh, Ariane Space CEO said that there was nine failures this year in total. Wow. Huh. I assume around the world. But statistically, I guess, is that match? Is that the number of failures? Are there more launches 
Therefore, the like is how I, I want to know the the number of launches versus the percentage of failures. Is the percentage of failures any higher? If it is a higher percentage of failure, is it because of all the new rockets out there? Um, okay, so uh, David, new membership. Thank you so much. Uh, Nick uh, al alumni says, "Hey Tim, uh, love the videos. Uh, how do they measure altitude, velocity, and position of rockets precisely when traditional means are often Earth based?" Um, that's actually I don't honestly know too much about guidance I'm, I'm, I'm watching actually a series while i've been working on this project uh i'm working on finalizing the family tree before we shoot the video to make sure that the my whole soviet rocket engine history facts are all correct um but uh in doing so i've been watching this a4 slash v2 documentary series basically where they take apart like every piece this is awesome thing on youtube and this guy goes through every single inch of that vehicle. Fascinating, phenomenal work. Uh, I, I should probably try to find it because I feel like that's uh, like all I've been watching for the past like almost all week <laughs> while I'm while I'm doing work that doesn't require um, my full attention. Hang on, like the uh, like the family tree. I can kind of do that in the background. Where is this? Um, I believe it's something like nature in something. Uh, engine let me let me see i'll find it uh astronomy and nature tv huge shout out to astronomy and nature tv i've learned a lot about uh the a4 and uh and how they worked and all this stuff because of astronomy and nature tv on youtube uh really long we're talking hours each like each little video is like an hour just going through every piece and it's really 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 fun um let's see so yeah there that's uh yeah that's what was I answering though? Uh, how do they measure altitude? So yeah, he even took apart the gyroscope and stuff like that. So, you know, I think back in the day you had, you'd used ground tracking stations and basically use the Doppler effect. You know, they would measure Doppler shift to, to precisely measure how fast the rocket's going. And, and some of this stuff, uh, early rockets, you would actually have to send data back and forth in order to actually fly it. So that was crazy, honestly. <laughs> um, but for the most part though, uh, nowadays, I'm sure a lot of it's GPS based, a lot of it's, you know, gyroscopes and accelerometer based. Um, and yeah, GPS definitely aids. And as a matter of fact, did you know that off the shelf GPS, if it exceeds a certain velocity and a certain altitude, it shuts off. Like by de fact, like you cannot <laughs> continue to receive data once it exceeds a certain parameter, uh, for safety reasons, for considerations of, uh, you know, uh, of national security and so that people aren't using a GPS transponder. Um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's how that works or for like an intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, Carl Weber, uh, I saw a video uh, where someone followed the ISS with a telescope and is extremely precise. Is there a solution for launches? Also software tracker. That's exactly what we're using. You saw astronomy live. You saw Scott Ferguson tracking the ISS. That's the exact solution. He's the one that got us set up with telescopes so that when we have telescopes out at the, the launch pad, uh, Mary Liz Bender, Ryan Chalinski from Cosmic Perspective, that's exactly what we use. We use his software. We use his control schemes. He helped us get set up. So yeah. Um, that's exactly what we do. Um, other than geographic necessity, why would retrograde orbit be desired? Um, so it's not really typical, but there are some weird orbits that are slightly retrograde. Um, as a matter of fact, if I remember right, a sun synchronous is actually slightly retrograde. Like I believe it's 95 degrees or something like that, 93. So it is slightly retrograde in order to get into that uh, orbit that has this little bit of angular momentum with the sun and stays in its exact um, yeah. Um, oh, that's cool. Elon saying that, uh, reiterating that the cast titanium grid fins are the largest cast titanium part in the world. No heat shielding needed. Super, super cool. Yeah, that, uh, I love that. Um, so this is from, uh, J O E N K E nine John K. Uh, just for you to, to butcher my name because I love people doing it. You got me. You got me. You literally, uh, you got me because I absolutely butchered it so bad. <laughs> Musical Wolves was Cup of Noodles originally space food? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't, I, that doesn't ring. I mean, I know what Cup of Noodles uh, is, but I don't, I've never heard whether or not it was originally space food. Um, yeah. Uh, not Heisenberg. How's it going? No people on the Island. It's a nature reserve. Interesting. Thank you. Not Heisenberg. Yeah, I did. I didn't know that. I appreciate you dropping some facts. 
Um, Ivan P, been a fan of a uh, bit of fan since Spacesuit Time 2. Daughter asks, why do I like rockets? That's actually a great question. Um, I, You know what I think it is? I really like um, when humans push the boundaries, when humans are, are doing things that are really hard and they achieve that really hard thing. And rockets, to me, ex- like they are the poster child of things that are barely possible, like barely physically possible. If Earth was even... Five percent bigger and had five percent more gravity. Most spaceflight would be almost. I mean, it would it would be substantially harder. It wouldn't be five percent harder. It would be substantially harder. Uh, and in the same way, if it's five percent less gravity, spaceflight would be quite a bit easier. And uh, it's just to me, it represents when humans work their hardest on things uh, and do things that are well beyond what one individual person can do. You know, it's teams of people coming together, international teams working together, like today's mission. Uh, just doing big things for humanity, for our planet, and actually the only way to properly explore the stars and explore other worlds. It's only possible through rockets. And then on top of that, I just like the flamey end. I like the engineering. I like the the loud noises and and thinking about how all those pumps and everything work to make something move and, and how it's all about just, uh, you know, increasing the performance of these vehicles. I think that's that's what I like. That's what I like. How about you guys? I want to know what you guys are into as far as space flight. What, what, what draws you? What's the draw for you? Why are you here watching today? Uh, from uh, Mukesh says, congrats on uh, 800,000. Thank you so much. Will Falcon Heavy be crewed? No, we will never see a crew launch of Falcon Heavy. Falcon Heavy is not human certified, despite being, you know, mostly based on the Falcon 9, which of course is, is verified and certified for human flight. The Falcon Heavy will never... Uh, well, honestly, we'll, we'll never be rated for human flight. There's no intention to do that. It would be cool if they did because they could open up a lot of possibilities for sending, you know, something out to, you know, sending a Dragon capsule potentially out towards to the moon, translator injection, but it would still have to get intercepted once out there. But you could, you could do a lot more possibilities with, say, the Artemis program if the Falcon Heavy uh, indeed uh, basically, you know, was was human certified. So... Uh, yeah, it will not be crewed, unfortunately. Uh, I would love to see that. I think we'd all love to see that. It was originally intended to be, but it, it will not. Sean uh, Fitzgerald says, thanks for the feed, Tim. Proud to be uh, a provider of NDT inspection equipment of many of the launch providers ensuring structural integrity of vehicles. That's cool. I didn't know that that was a company that does inspection, uh, the inspection equipment for a lot of the launch providers. That's awesome. Thank you for working in the aerospace industry and helping ensure the rockets are structurally integral. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Al Set says, are there any simulated time-lapse videos of every launch from the Cape Canaveral showing their trajectory? That's a good question. I don't know um, if there's a time-lapse. Vi- That'd be really cool just to see it like, in history, even like shooting all off like that, that'd actually be a really cool video. Um, I would like to see that. If anyone wants to work on that, I'm sure the community could probably put that out, put that together. That'd be really cool. Uh, Peter Danilov or Danilov. Yeah. Danilov, Danilov. Uh, as always, thanks Tim asking, asked during crew one, but left my computer. Would installing a hyperloop on Mars be a good idea? Uh, y- you wouldn't, I actually did answer this on the, on that stream. You wouldn't need a hyperloop. You could use just a maglev because there's only 1% atmosphere on Mars. So therefore, you know, you could get to nearly orbital velocities using a maglev. uh, And there's very relatively low air resistance. So you really wouldn't need uh, to do. So, of course, a hyperloop, the cool thing here on Earth is you you put a, you know, you basically have a tube. You suck all the air out of it. And then you have a, uh, you know, you have a a maglev like a where it's basically an earth magnet and a, and a polarized magnet that you can switch and, and change currents on it and, and propel something. You know, that's how high speed trains work. They can go, you know, 400, 500 kilometers an hour, two or 300 miles an hour. These are, you know, really, really fast. Um, that's how those trains work. And then obviously if you stuck that in a tube and, and sucked all the air out, it could go a lot faster because it's biggest, it doesn't have any friction, you know, against the rails because it's, it's hovering. So obviously if you stick it inside of a tube and take all the air out of it, uh, it could go quite a bit faster. Now on Mars, you wouldn't need to worry about that tube part so much because there's only 1% atmosphere. Uh, now, of course, if you get up to <laughs> orbital velocity in that 1% atmosphere, you do have to, you know, you're, if you're at sea level, yeah, you'd, you'd really uh, get real, real, real spicy, but it could definitely aid in assisting. The big deal, the big issue with any of those, um, any of those solutions where you have something that say, um, 
you know, going to throw a rocket or drop a rocket from a plane or maglev it or slingshot it or whatever, is you commit to launching something before the engines are going. You'll notice that most rockets, when they are about to launch, they hold on to them, turn on the engines, make sure everything's okay, and then let go of them. Uh, you can't really do that uh, necessarily if you're doing like a some kind of ground, you know, slingshot thing where you're going to launch it up, you know, and then have it turn on its engines because there's this, a decent chance, not a not a 100% chance. I mean, there's maybe even a 2% chance that it's just going to fall right back down, right? Or what happened with, with Virgin Orbit on their first orbital flight test, they dropped that, that rocket, it turned on its engine, and it almost immediately had a problem that if it was attached to a, a launch pad, they probably could have turned it off um, and saved the vehicle. But instead, they ended up just dropping a rocket from the sky, basically. Um, <laughs> Latchlin in our Discord says, sea level on Mars. That's, that's a good point. Uh, what would you say? Hmm. I don't, I don't know actually what you'd say there. Uh, Michael Downing says, Tim, keep up the great work. I learn something new every time I watch great merch. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, we have a lot of fun. Uh, get ready for a big store flip here this week. Actually, it's we're coming up. This is like Black Friday week and holiday week. So we're doing a big old store flip. Uh, we will have some sales coming uh, for Black Friday. And uh, yeah, you should see a brand new web store with some new integrations and some upgrades to international shipping, finally, that you guys have been asking for. It's not a perfect solution. It's still not, we're not, we just don't have the capability or the logistics to be able to do uh, fulfillment directly from Europe. So have like a separate fulfillment center. That's just another, we just don't, we can't run that right now. Like it's already too hard to try and keep operational, but we do have some cool things. Um, you'll be able to do localized shopping currency. It'll tell you everything about your VAT, how much it's going to cost for customs uh, uh, based on your country, based on how much you're spending. It'll pay those customs so that you actually get your merchandise in three to five days instead of like three to five weeks sometimes when it gets stuck in customs. Uh, so it's going to be a lot better solution. And uh, yeah, uh, and better tracking and a lot faster. So, and also just more uh, easier shopping experience for for international shipping too. So, but it's going to be look way different. I, I'm excited to show you guys it. It'll be awesome. So, thank you, uh, Razenbot. Do you think suborbital tours will be profitable for companies like Virgin Galactic when Starship is fully orbital? That's a good question. I mean, if Starship, even if Starship wants to just do you know the this, the Earth to Earth stuff or the suborbital hops. I think it's going to be a long time before that really is a, an option. Um, so I think there will be a good decade of, oh, look at, by the way, I, I just want to show you guys really quick. Oh, it moved already, but the Vandenberg fog is rolling in now, which is hilarious that now it's rolling in after the launch for the first time ever <laughs> instead of the other way around. Um, but uh, as far, I think there's going to be a good decade of, of suborbital space tourism before something like Starship comes in and is human rated, human certified, and fully capable of supporting those point to point, at least a decade. I mean, there might be a good two decades. Um, here, real quick, look at, good thing this launch took off when it did because it is like fog city already. That is crazy. See, that's what it's normally like. There's always this, this cloud layer out of Vandenberg. I just think that's hilarious. Um yeah, that's a good question, though. I think there's going to be a while before Starship is human certified and doing any kind of uh, thing that the average person can do. So, but it'll happen. Philip Moyer, uh, morning, Tim. A standard BCTF Boca Chica Taco Fund donation. Bags packed. Philip, thank you. First off, uh, I have literally had a bag packed. I've I've, be, I've put stuff in the car, literally like getting ready to head on the road, and then. Uh, the last time I did that was when they had that last static fire issue. Like I was planning to leave the next morning uh, when it did that concrete thing. And they lost that one Raptor. I was ready. I was pa bags packed, bags mostly packed, like pretty much ready to, to go down the next morning. Uh, that's why I don't like if I had gone down tr hoping, thinking that, OK, they're going to do that. And then, go, you know, go a day later. And I went down for it. I would have been sitting down in Texas in a hotel room now for weeks already or a week or two. Um, so. Yeah, it's I, I'm literally ready to go, but I'm just waiting to see some of that stuff really, really solidify before I, I commit to going down there. Because it's not fun to drive four days uh, in a pandemic and uh, yeah, and be safe about it. And then being in a hotel room and stuff for that long also can get cabin fevery. So uh, 
<laughs> Wooden 18. Hilarious. Thank you, Tim. You're awesome. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Uh, Mitchell Paradise, uh, thanks for the great content. Can you explain how memberships work? I've never joined a channel before. Are there other platforms to support you? Uh, Mitchell, yeah. So the, the main thing that we do uh, is, is Patreon. Um, if you want to join Patreon, you go to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. That's the, the easiest way to support what I do. And there you can gain access to our Discord channel, um, exclusive live streams and stuff like that. But members also get access to live streams um, and, and early sneak peeks of some videos too. So um, the YouTube membership is just a way that um, if people that support can kind of get early access to things and some access to uh, live streams as well, some exclusive live streams, which by the way, we need to probably do that before I head out. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, patreon.com slash everyday astronaut or right here on YouTube memberships work as well too. Patreon takes less of a cut and there's a few more options there, the better integration with some things like discord. So, um, yeah, that, thank you so much for wanting to support what I do. That really means a lot. Uh, Bob Easton. Thank you so much. Um, Jesse. O, please never remove the pointy end up shirt. I need one when UK shipping is better. Also, my granddad doesn't believe we went to the moon. Tell him off. Well, this is a, a fun topic to talk about. Are, are you ready, Jesse? Do you want do you want my your granddad needs to think about this logistically? Um, first off, there's no denying that the United States built what was it, eighteen or thirteen? I think it was thirteen Saturn V rockets. Right? These are massive rockets. So if hmm, here we go. <laughs> We know for a fact the Soviet Union built four N1s. We have launch footage of that. We have all the stuff. We know how big that rocket was. Uh, if so, if, if you're going to say things like the United States faked the Apollo program to bankrupt the, the N1 or bankrupt the Soviet Union, then why did the United States build 13 of the world's largest rockets ever, most capable rockets ever, and launch them? So you, you definitely can't deny that the United States launched the biggest rocket that was seen by hundreds of thousands of people. There's so much footage of it. Uh, so why would you build all of that? And just to fake it, like if you're going to fake it, don't build the rocket. Like you're now, you're employing 400,000 people to fake something. And then you still have to fake it. So first you have to literally, we have the receipts for 400,000 people that worked at some capacity on the Saturn V program, on the, the Apollo program. So if you're going to employ all those, and create the world's most convincing film ever using Stanley Kubrick, who, by the way, was at the time basically working on 2001 Space Odyssey, which if you he, you can see what it would have looked like if he had faked the moon landing by watching that film because there's a scene that's supposed to look like the moon. Looks nothing like the moon, I'm sorry to say. Looks nothing like the actual footage from the moon. Uh, you'd, why, how, would, how would we have done that? How would we have simultaneously uh, developed the most advanced rocket, done all the engineering, done all of the stuff to physically do it and fake it. Like you can't have it both ways. You, we either, and we have all the hardware, we have all the papers, we have all of the receipts for that. And so does the Soviet Union. Not only that, the Soviet Union congratulated us on going to the moon. They tracked our spacecraft going to the moon. You'd think our mortal cold war enemies that were racing us to the moon would have been like, Oh, we, they never once called, you know, false flag being like, they aren't doing what they're saying they're doing. They were, they were tracking our progress the whole time. They have ground tracking stations. They have ways to know what we were doing. They were spying on us. We were spying on them. That's how this all worked. Why, why wouldn't they have called it out? Why wouldn't they have been like, oh, this is all fake. You know, it would have sparked a war, uh, escalated the war more if the United States tried to pull that off. Obviously that's not what happens. Um, the, the other thing to me is is the footage. So there's a really, really good thing on YouTube um, that this guy breaks down. He's a photographer. So the photographer for me loves this, this YouTube video um, because he, he goes through why it would have been physically impossible to fake the moon landings using um, film from that time. I'm going to find this here. Uh, Apollo film uh, fake. I don't know. Why you couldn't fake the, um, why you couldn't fake the moon landing film. Okay. So this is awesome. Watch this. And just in the technology of the footage here, um, this is well worth watching. Uh, it's video from space. This is a, um, yeah, this, this guy breaks down every aspect of film at the time of digital cameras at the time and and tells you 
why it would have been physically impossible to fake the footage that we saw from the moon landings. And it's phenomenal. I mean, definitely watch this. Yeah, moon landings faked. Filmmaker says not. Watch this. I promise you'll love it. Uh, I learned a lot about cameras and stuff. And again, I'm a professional photographer. But yeah, the it's just utterly ridiculous to think. Um, but that's, yeah, there's my rant. <laughs> there's my rant. Uh, why did, okay, so why did SpaceX remove their telemetry and, uh, and the overlays? So, uh, it w because it was actually a NASA stream. So NASA kind of took over the whole broadcast. And unfortunately that, yeah, it's, it's sad that they don't have that capability. So it's just kind of old school, but luckily we had what we had too. So Mark, thank you for the membership. Uh, Robert also, thank you so much for the tip. And well, in the question here. Uh, Robert says, would be cool if Declan made velocity altitude numbers turn red when they are decreasing. So we're actually working on a new overlay that will have like gauges. So you can kind of see, uh, a little bit of better visualization of those numbers. Um, we can, we can do all that in code. So we're working on a, on a update and some of that stuff will be available for serial number eight. We're going to do a new graphical overlay that you guys will see. And it should be pretty cool. Um, Mark says the most, uh, informative launch I've ever witnessed. Great job. Oh, thank you. Thanks for tuning in. I feel like we didn't even dive that deep into some of the aspects, but I do really, uh, I, I just love this stuff. This is what I, this is what I'm here for. Um, this is from Honolog, uh, lucky Jesse strikes again. Yeah. She's when she's on stream, we know it's going to be a good launch. Uh, Julian, uh, Os Ospina says, uh, you should move to Florida. I don't think I should move to Florida. There's a lot. I mean, I want to have a presence there. I want to have a place to put things. But realistically, these days, well, especially right now, but normally I'm I'm down in Florida two or three times a year. I'm also in Texas two, three, four times a year. I'm in California three to four or five times a year. Why would I live in Florida, per se? I, I, I like where I live right now. I have 10 gig internet. Uh, I am centrally located. I live five miles from an airport. I can go anywhere from there. And if I'm going you know, to Texas, Florida, California. Those are the, my hot spots. I also seem to go to like, seems like I'm going out to uh, DC a decent amount. Uh, it seems like once a year. I just don't have a, I love Florida and I would actually, like like I said, I'd love to kind of spend winters there maybe, but I don't want a full blown move there. You know, I, I love my family and friends here in Iowa. So um, yeah. Um, uh, were they using better mics? Uh, sorry, Ooh, uh, NASA. I mean, it was probably the same mics, but what you, I think the audio we were hearing was probably the labs off of the people's chests, honestly, instead of the, we didn't hear the pad audio, which is, which is too bad, but, um, it was cool that you kind of experienced it as they would experience it. So that was fun. Uh, black Knight says, uh, hello, a fan of you, but the electron rocket launch clearly indicated that the main parachute did not open and you ignored the telemetry. Um, no, the, that's not at all true i don't know where you're seeing that at all uh the the so the the telemetry that we had on screen sorry if you're if you're talking about my coverage of the rocket lab launch let's let's pull this up um don't forget we had uh we had our own telemetry that was simulated telemetry it was experimental telemetry on our end um so we don't know you know how our telemetry did Let, let's get it out here um but it absolutely, the full, they, you know, Rocket Lab said that it, it, you know, it did everything it needed to do. And let's see here. Let's, so if you're looking at our screen, um, let's see here. So simulated stage one telemetry, uh, we, you know, Declan was making his best guess on this, but um, yeah, as a matter of fact, it looked like it was, yeah, I mean, so if you're relying on this, the fact that it, oh, I think if I remember right, it still said something like hundreds of kilometers an hour or something when it hit the, the ground. Um, again, it was a simulated telemetry. It was not live data. This up here, it, that's not first stage telemetry in the top right corner of the rocket lab stream. That is the actual telemetry of the upper stage, not of the first stage. So yeah, this, okay. So this was our stage one simulated telemetry. It had no tie to the actual stream. So it looks like Declan needs to just kind of tweak it a little bit. He he actually said that he didn't end up doing any, uh, he, he didn't model the parachute at all. So, so that's probably why you saw a uh, velocity of 300 or 400 or whatever. Um, and then Rocket Lab again tweeted that everything looked good. It, you know, according to Rocket Lab, the booster would have survived, which it clearly did. 
um, if the parachute hadn't deployed. So here we see clearly in this tweet, the main parachute having deployed what looks like uh, little to no damage to the booster. That booster would not be there if that main chute didn't deploy, I'll tell you that. But they also said here, um, payload deployment confirmed. Uh, let's see here. And here's main chute, view of the main chute from Electron's first stage. So there we go. Um, confirmation that we have both drogue and main parachute. So yeah, I mean, again, just they, it happened. If you were relying on our first stage telemetry, uh, that was incorrect. But all other facts are are that so yeah uh josh b would it be possible for you to interview jesse um i'm assuming it'd go against some kind of spacex employee rule it's really hard to interview any employee at spacex um i'm working to hopefully develop a relationship that allows that spacex comms department know i'm going to kind of keep them in their lane talk to them only about say not even that specifically what they do but why they you know why they work at spacex kind of their personal journey so that it's not uh, any kind of breach in protocol or ITAR or anything like that or in you know internal intellectual property of SpaceX and, and how they operate. But I think it'd be really fun to get to know the people that we see on camera uh, with with SpaceX and also at, at other rocket launch providers too. It'd, be, it'd just be fun to hear the stories of how people got to where they are, uh, what their favorite parts are, you know, just kind of get to know a rocket scientist. I think it would be a really fun series. So if, uh, if SpaceX allows me to do that, I will absolutely do that. I would absolutely do that. But yeah, I've obviously talked to Elon. Elon's the only one I can really talk to easily because he can talk about whatever he wants. It's his company. So they don't have to worry too much about putting a muzzle on him or worried that I'll ask him questions that that he can't talk about because he talks about whatever he wants to talk about. <laughs> and I think comms also doesn't love that though too. But uh, Derek SP, uh, thank you for covering all the launches, Tim. Hopefully I'll be able to rejoin your Patreon and Discord soon. Well, thank you, Derek. I mean, don't worry about it. <laughs> We're in a pandemic. Uh, I, I totally understand it's not necessary anyway. Uh, obviously, as you guys know, I'm, I'm pouring everything I can back into what I do. So we're constantly upgrading equipment, just making, uh, you know, we have more and more of a team happening now. So yeah, um, absolutely. So thank you. Uh, I really appreciate your tip and I appreciate your, your support. I mean, that means a lot. A uh, new membership from uh, Jababy. Thank you so much. And Alan Gunn, I appreciate your membership too. Uh, let's see, uh, Baloo, it looked like artificial footage. Is it a secret? No, there was no artificial footage. It was all real. And I guarantee there's thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people along the West coast that, that saw that launch with their own eyes. Um, it's not a secret payload. The trajectory is published. I mean, everything was normal about it. It's just, they, it was 720, and then just what looked like horrible footage coming in ingested from NASA. So, um, nope, it was just a beautiful day too. Nathan Little, your your Starship static fire reaction was priceless. Consider considering the uh, Ma Ma Martite incident, which is the the what we learned they have on top of concrete to make it uh, more thermally and rockety, flamey and downy impact capable. What are your thoughts on no flame diverter for orbital launch mount? I think that's an absolute no go in my books. I think there's going to need to be if they're going to have. I mean, if one you know essentially one to three Raptor engines destroyed the launch pad the the concrete below it uh what's 24 to 30 going to do <laughs> i mean there's just no way they have to have some kind of um sound suppression energy suppression uh, a water dampening system of some kind um and and then spray down the the launch pad and and yeah i that orbital launch mount will have to have something it, it will there's yeah <laughs> Uh, Keith Merrifield, my son Elliot is three and he loves watching your streams. Keep up the great coverage. Well, thank you, Keith. And thank you, Elliot. Thank you guys for tuning in. That means a lot. Uh, I hope you guys had a great weekend. That was an awesome, uh, an awesome way to start the weekend for some of us, <laughs> depending on where you are. Uh, Robert says, uh, I take my first engineering class in January, going back to school to change careers after 10 years in marketing. That is awesome, Robert. Seriously, that type of stuff makes me so excited again. Yeah, I, you know, five years ago, I, I wasn't doing anything of this nature at all. I was a professional photographer. I had no ties to aerospace at all, at all, like none. So, uh, yeah, I, I love hearing cause it can happen. You know, you absolutely can change. You can do whatever you want to do in life. Like anyone can do whatever they want. As long as it doesn't, you're not hurting somebody or doing something illegal, but as far as, you know, a career path and, and doing what you want to do in life, you know, why there's no reason to ever wait on anything. Just, just do it. You know, <laughs> it was scary for me when I first stopped being a photographer, which was paying very well. I made 
very good money as a as a mostly a wedding photographer. Uh, did a lot of international weddings. Um, was doing was doing well. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was terrifying to jump into a career that I had no money, like literally zero dollars uh, coming in from anything. I didn't even know that I was going to be doing YouTube. I just wanted to do everyday astronaut full time. I didn't know what it was. So jumping in and making big life changes is sometimes absolutely worth it, you know. Um, so good luck. We're all cheering for you. Uh, NATO Nathan, I'm a comp sci major looking to get a job in aerospace as software engineer after university. That is awesome. Again, love to hear it. I think... You know, this new ge- we have a new generation. This is the new Apollo era where people are realizing that they can participate in the aerospace uh, community and 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 do something to help humans go and explore more. That's super cool. Um, all right, this is from uh, Jorge or or George. Hey Tim, greetings from Bolivia. Watching here with my dad. Good to see you as always. Uh, George has such a big crush on Jesse Anderson. She is an amazing engineer and amazing hip hop artist. Yeah. I know that she's done music. I haven't heard any of her music though. She is awesome. I I think she was, I I don't know if she played professional basketball or for sure collegiate level, but I I think she, uh, rips up the court too. She seems like a really cool person. We've never actually met, but we've, you know, uh, all of, you know, the space community is only, it's only so big. So you end up talking to people, uh, fairly often, but, um, she seems like just an awesome person. So. Glad to see you're on the stream, as always. Uh, Stefan, again. or Hi, Tim. Greetings from Germany. I will study chemical engineering next year. Do you think this would be useful in the rocket business? It is, absolutely. I mean, uh, chemical engineering, there's... I mean, that's still a huge part of rockets. Uh, You could even, you know, if you really want to risk it or or something, not risk it, but if you really want to hone yourself in, learn about uh, methane development and, you know, in-situ resource utilization, the Sabatier process, maybe... Maybe kind of just focus on that a little bit in the background, you know, like as you're studying chemical engineering, just think about how you can uh, use that knowledge and use that uh, as a, to kind of hone in a career to work in methane because there's going to be a lot of methane powered rockets in the in the future. So if you are an expert at, at producing methane, do it. Um yeah, and in, in Germany, uh, this is awesome. Uh, Wani X in Discord says, in Germany, I attended a subject called chemical propulsion. That's part of chemical engineering, that's for sure. Uh, Jake, great stream. What a beautiful launch landing. That was awesome. Thank you for tuning in, Jake. I really appreciate that. Um, Derek SP, the the GPS security feature is within the receiver chip since GPS is one way. Rockets can use GPS if they use proprietary GPS chips, no matter the speed. That's true, yes. But off the sh- off the shelf uh, GPS chips, like if you were to go to Walmart and buy a GPS thing, uh, or the things on our phones, even they would would shut down uh, and and stop tra- and stop receiving data or stop showing the data uh, at a certain speed and, and altitude for safety reasons. Um, let's see. Rish Rishaba says, uh, "Hey Tim, great work, man. I love watching your stream and channel. Amazing stuff you're doing to understanding rockets, science. Love from India. Well, thank you so much. I really I hope someday to come to India. That is very much on my list. I've never been to India. I've been to." Southeast Asia, three or four times, three or four, four, I don't remember. And I've been to Africa a few times and I've always wanted to go to India. I feel like I've been right, you know, on either side of it now, basically, but never in India. I want to see a launch from India. That'd be awesome. Israel, hit me up. I'll come and get everyone stoked about it. Uh, that'd be awesome. Um, Night Fox says, rockets, not possible, necessary. So true. So true. Thank you, Night Fox. Good seeing you. Um, Tylen, thank you so much for your tip. I appreciate it. Uh, Pedro Ortiz says, hi, Tim. Or, hey, Tim, does the Dragon capsule have a backup plan in case of a launch slash orbit damage similar to that of the space shuttle backup capsule? Great job. Uh, the space shuttle didn't really actually have a backup capsule. There were plans for a little bit to have like a, a backup, like to be a deorbit. And, you know, there was even plans to have a, a type of space that looked like an Iron Man suit. They could literally supposedly... I mean, it didn't get very far in, in the schemes, but like deorbit using just a spacesuit pretty much, which would be the most ridiculous thing ever. Um, the Dragon Capsule, I don't think it has any kind of backup plan in case of orbital damage. But the cool thing about Dragon Capsule is while it's on orbit, don't forget it's attached to the International Space Station, of course. So um, they can segment stuff, you know, seal off sections of the ISS if there were to ever be a leak, which there has been leaks before, as we know. There was just a leak uh, found a little bit ago that was... Very small. We're talking very, very, very small. 
Uh, and they just found that. So it happens often. You know, there's a leak inside a Soyuz vehicle last year. And um, the option there is so as far as one after it undocks and reenters, the chances of it, you know, having some kind of orbital damage after it undocks, you know, it's only out there for four to eight hours. The chances of it hitting some debris and having some damage are extremely low. But when you're up there on station for six months, the odds are, you know, higher. Uh, so the chance there, say something would happen and they realize, oh my word, there's a huge hole in the Dragon capsule. Uh, they would have to launch, you know, they could, they have other vehicles there as lifeboats, basically. So right now it'd be Soyuz. Uh, actually, I don't know how that works right now with, I think there's still two Soyuz attached and a Dragon capsule, but there's seven people. So they wouldn't be able to use two Soyuzes if the Dragon, they'd maybe be able to launch, um, you know, stay up on station, launch resupplies and do things until a new dragon capsule could go up there and all that. But, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you. The legacy. I appreciate that. I, I just, I'm not seeing that in, in discord. I do appreciate that. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll remember that <laughs> and I'll, I'll get myself a coffee today. Uh, musical wolves, uh, could, Attaching LIDAR to a satellite in the outer solar system make finding planet X easier. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the, so the problem with planet X is it's so far away and it's obviously so far away that it's, you know, light from the sun would be its main source of illumination because it's the obviously if it's orbiting the sun that's the closest star by a massive amount and light falls off with the square inverse law so if it's twice as far away from something it gets four times less bright so obviously if it's like a hundred times further away from uh than earth is it's whatever the square of that <laughs> i'm not gonna i'll mess that up on air i guarantee it uh so uh so square cube law so i don't know whatever it is times 1.4 or something or times two or whatever uh someone tell me <laughs> if it's 100 times further away how much less bright is it uh so so the problem is um you know this is in a tiny narrow patch of sky from any va vantage point even if we had something in orbit which we can't really to put something in orbit way out there um you know you might end up being twice as far away from planet x right if there is a planet x um i think we're better off just just using um you know, just using regular telescopes and stuff like that. But I don't know if, if LIDAR would really, I don't know. Cause it's not like it would, you know, it has to be a powerful LIDAR source in order to really be able to reflect off something or, or see something that we can't see. So a um, hundred times further away squared is, is 10,000. Um, but is it, but that's not quite how that works. If it's twice as far away, it's four times brighter because it's a square cube law or square inverse. So I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> um, Tim, my husband, Charlie, is obsessed with your channel. Do you know why they launched from Vandenberg instead of Cape Canaveral? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but let me pull this up here for you guys um, just so no one misses it. Uh, if we go to flightclub.org or .io, um, you'll notice. So this was a, uh, a basically a polar orbit. It went 60 degrees south. Um, now from Florida, if you were to do that, which we did just recently, there was the, uh, the SOWCOM 1B mission did a polar orbit from Florida, but it's really unusual to do that. It has to be a, a, a right circumstances. They basically get to thread the needle and, and go down here and not overfly, you know, Cuba and stuff like that. So, um, for the most part, polar orbits are always going to be here. Oh, weird. This one, this one shows the booster landing down range. Declan. Declan, what do you, what happened? Anyway, uh, <laughs> so this is, if you see, obviously, if you're flying on a polar orbit anywhere south, uh, doing it from Vandenberg Air Force Base, you don't overfly any populated areas. That's the whole rule of thumb, at least in the United States. So China and Russia kind of do their own things, uh, and they do let boosters drop uh, on land and sometimes terrifyingly close or inside of villages and stuff like that. Not a good idea. But um, but this way, you know, no, nothing flies over land. So as you can see, this is now in a polar orbit, kind of like this, boop to boop, and uh, and yeah, and getting there from California is the easiest way to do that. So flying straight south will uh, will allow it to get into that polar orbit. Most most launches from Kennedy Space Center are 28 degrees or north. 
Um, so it'll be straight east from here. So the, the azimuth, the flight azimuth would be straight east, um, but then it can go up to about 60 degrees north here, as long as it's not overflying the land um, along the east coast of the United States. So yeah, again, if you guys have questions about uh, like kind of azimuths and, and inclinations and stuff, definitely watch that video I have about why do cylindrical rockets roll because we go into a lot of that stuff. It's it's actually one of those those videos that I learned a ton making. So I yeah, so there's a lot of fun reasons. Uh, let's see here. This is from Rise or, or Reese. Sorry, I learned it's Reese. Uh, great work, sir. My daughter and I watch almost every launch during waking hours, and we and we watch every launch with you. Would love to run into you after the pandemic at the Cape one day. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Reese, and thanks for watching with again watching with your family. That means a lot to me. That's that's awesome. Something that you guys can do together. And yes, as soon as this pandemic is over, oh man, and, and it's safe to to have large gatherings. I promise you, we'll be doing more meetups. I, I can't wait to do meetups. I think we're to the point now. Like I said, someday my goal. I want to be able to do like a speaking tour or something where, um, you know, I'll visit like a bunch of cities in Europe, a bunch of cities in the United States, do a speaking tour and maybe try to find some other speakers along with me or something. And we'll do presentations or something, some cool night of rocket science or something and and do something and then just have like a, a party. I, I think that sounds like a lot of fun. But um, oh, there was payload deploy on air. OK, sorry. there. I didn't realize this. I didn't realize they were airing it. Okay, yeah, correct. no worries. Again, we deal with lots of numbers. Um, Callie, I appreciate you being here with us. Well, Thanks so much. And for some reason, I, th I thought they were done at the webcast because so they, they use as had people off camera so, so much. Just the way that it works is that, um, you know, we start hey, Callie, in, um, I want to jump in there for a second. Just in the to early say, parts to a we're looking at the spacecraft separation right now. Um, I want to let you finish, but we're getting that live, and I wanted to call that out for you. So there goes Sentinel-6. Uh, that is a beautiful sight. Uh, watching it drift off there. Again, we are kind of shaded by the Earth, um, so we're not in direct sunlight at this time. Um, so that's why it's as dark as it is. Uh, if the sun were on this side of the Earth, we'd see a little bit more of that, but that's going to kind of just drift off, and that's completely normal and expected. So, Callie, I do want to let you finish. Sorry for, for jumping. Very cool. Sorry, yeah. Sorry we missed that live, but that's great. That's all that matters is, is getting that payload where it needs to go. So thank you again, Reese. Uh, yeah, and like I said, someday I will – you know, we'll have meetups, we'll have like a tour or something, and we'll all be able to hang out. And it'll be awesome. Uh, Mohammed, uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, this is from, um, I'll just say Adrian, sorry. Uh, when, a vi when a video about all kinds of rockets with Scott Manley, Marcus House, and Felix, uh, or do a video maybe with, with those guys, it's hard that, I mean, those collaborations are super fun. And I, I love all all three of those guys and, every, and NASA Space Flight, you know, and, and Kevin. I love the spaceflight community, but it, the collaborations can be hard when you're all talking about the same thing. We're all kind of doing similar things. So it's not like, you know, when you collaborate, you normally try to collaborate with an artist or someone that does something kind of different than you. You know, that's, um, you'll see, I do have a collaboration coming up in the Soviet rocket engine video uh, with a friend of mine that, that I think will be a fun one because it's just, it's just a funny little skit. But, um, but as far as like, I don't really know what would three or four of us really do for a video together. That wouldn't just be stuff that any, any one of us would just talk about on our own, you know, unless it's just like sharing screen time. And then at that point it's probably actually a net negative for almost everyone. Cause then, you know, like it doesn't, does it help one channel? Do we put that same video up on four channels? Do you have, you know, how, how does that work? It, logistically collaborations in educational videos don't always make the most sense. Um, but I would, you know, I would love to work with those guys or, or do the speaking tour or something like that. Um, this is from Hans space and I just want to be part of a group. This is true. We all, everyone craves community. Um, I think a lot of the, the stuff with conspiracy theories is feeling like you have unlocked some knowledge that other people don't know. And now you're in, you know, you're in like an elite club of people that under, that really understand how things work. That's, it's, it's an, it's an, uh, desire to belong and desire to be in a group. Absolutely. So, um, that's kind of the, the root of a lot of that. So Thomas says, uh, watching from Italy with my two year old son. That is awesome. Well, thank you so much again. I love that. There's so many people watching with their families. You guys are awesome. Uh, Matt says, what's my favorite, uh, uh, whole hall of girl. I don't even know what that means. Oh, hollow live. I've read it as hall olive. So obviously I, I don't think I know what that even means. Um, 
Hmm. I'll say the 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 one that teaches me about space. <laughs> I don't know if I was even supposed to have read that now that I'm thinking about it. I have no idea. Isuzu, is it possible to put a real or simulated G-Force meter on screen? Yes, we are working on that, actually. That will be part of our, our new template. So thanks for the suggestion. Uh, Cheyenne, thanks for the membership. Uh, Peter, uh, pretty soon you'll have uh, to rename your channel to Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronauts. Uh, I hope the rest of your crew can play instruments. Oh man, uh, Andrew, how what's your uh, what's your instrument of choice and website crew? Could we could we make a band? <laughs> Ridge, thank you for the membership. Uh, Brian Clausen got on this stream late, but you SpaceX and NASA hit this one out of the park here with the great work. Of course, as you guys know, I have nothing to do with these missions. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. But just to reiterate, make sure it's painfully obvious. I in no way work directly in the aerospace industry. I, I'm, I'm not out there. The one putting the parts together, doing the science, doing the engineering. I'm here to help teach you guys uh, as much as I know about that stuff so that we can appreciate the people that do the hard work at SpaceX, NASA, the other, the rest of the aerospace industry. Um, you know, my job is to be an everyday person, uh, someone that, that is just learning this stuff on my own for fun uh, and to bring it to you guys, to, to help lift up and celebrate the work being done by all of these um, incredibly talented, smart and hardworking individuals. So, uh, yeah, just a friendly reminder. I know you know this, Brian. I know you know this, but uh, thank you. Uh, but I, I in no way want to take any credit for the work being done by the professionals. Um, but we can all inspire to, again, cheer them on. And and maybe, as we're seeing today, a lot of people saying that they're going into this career path probably because of the work of the uh, amazing individuals. So um, what do you think is the hardest part of returning a first stage? My guess is the math. The math is fairly, that's something relatively solved. I mean, they know they know how to do it, obviously. Ballistic missiles and guided missiles have been doing this for ages. So it's, it's something that's been solved for a long time. Obviously, you know, we, we know how to re-enter uh, a rocket. We, we know how to, the, sp the space shuttle re-entered, could land on a runway with no backups. It never had the option of flying around or doing it all over again you know it could only glide it was a passive glider that never missed the runway so we know how to precisely land perfectly you know and even splashing down in the apollo capsule or today with the soyuz and and the dragon capsule we know how to precisely orient and land and obviously the falcon 9 knows how to, to do guidance i think the, the biggest challenge isn't the guidance aspects so much per se as the thermal constraints because again all of the energy that it took to launch think about how much energy you see the flames you see the huge rocket and it, to get something up to that speed when it comes back down that energy has to be removed the only way it gets removed is through atmosphere through the atmosphere the the drag of the atmosphere not the friction of the atmosphere that's a, a falsified people think it's air friction it's not really friction uh it's the compression of the air in front of the the vehicle or the the booster or the rocket or whatever and by compressing the air due to the laws of thermodynamics as air compresses, it heats up and it heats up so much that it turns into a plasma. And the, as you know, plasma is another state of matter like the sun. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's it's really, really, really hard to remove that energy without it having without that heat damaging and destroying the rocket. Um, so uh, math is obviously integral to all that math is is part of all of that part of the guidance. It's part of the heat and reentry profile and all that stuff. But um, but I think as far as the physical constraints why it's so difficult to do so a lot of its thermal conditions thermal considerations um yeah uh let's see kate b says uh hello again tim looking forward to the 15 kilometer flight our own apollo era yes absolutely should we give this era in space flight its own name commercial era or S starship era or artemis era uh I think so. We'll have to kind of see, I think, what ends up being the big thing. Right now, I feel like the reusability era might be the, the term I would coin because, you know, once Rocket Lab's reusing their boosters, once Blue Origin's reusing their boosters, I think we're, we're getting into the reusability era. Um, but other than that, maybe Artemis. Yeah. Or the, yeah, or the commercial era. Good question. Good question. I'm extremely looking forward to the 15-kilometer hop. That will be absolutely wild. Um, I, I have no idea whether or not it's actually like when it's going to happen. I have no idea how it's going to happen, if it will survive taking off. And, and now I'm so worried about concrete flying up and destroying an engine right as it takes off or something. 
Uh, well, whatever does happen, it'll be absolutely amazing. Um, this is from Junkie for Tube. I uh, just wanted to say you're doing a great job. Greetings from Croatia. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, Stevie uh, Steve Lewis says, Everyday astronaut, hey, Tim, how long uh, till payload deploy? NASA feed is not as good as SpaceX. It's true. Sorry, we kind of missed it. But yeah, it did happen. Payload has been deployed. As a matter of fact, I'm going to I'm going to pull down my uh, overlay here so people don't even necessarily think that there's anything else happening. Uh, thank you. This is from uh, El Wu or Eli Wu. Hey, Tim, if Starship needs takeoff suppression water, how will they be able to land with passengers safely? Also, is SLS dead now that Jim is gone? These are some loaded questions here. Uh, L, thank you for these awesome questions. So if Starship needs to take off, uh, how will it be able to land with passengers safely? So the landing pads, okay, so here's the deal. Um, as we know, SpaceX is able to land the Falcon 9 on a concrete pad without water suppression. So as far as landing safely on a concrete pad, pad it, it seems to be more doable, more manageable. Um, so far, we've only seen... So the Merlin is obviously about half as powerful as the Raptor engine. And so far, we've only seen Starship landing with a single Raptor engine. Uh, eventually, some flight profiles will might need two or three You know, for the actual final landing phase. I, I think there'll always be two for landing once it's a full all-up Starship. Um, at least two. The booster will will need probably you know two three maybe four or something running. We don't exactly know those numbers yet. So there will be and once you get to three Raptors or four Raptors, you're basically to the same output as a full Falcon Nine. There's definitely going to they're going to have to have a beefy 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 landing pad on Earth. On the Moon, of course, there's the option that the lunar version will have higher up engines. The gravity is obviously one six on the Moon, so you need one six the thrust. Um, you'll be landing on it basically empty, and those engines up top will help so it doesn't d uh, disrupt the regolith. It doesn't disrupt the, the moon surface too much, uh, not only to not to avoid cratering the, the ground, but also to avoid kicking debris up into orbit, basically, and having these orbital bullets flying around the moon every time you land. Not not a great idea. Um, but at the same time, on Mars, you know, Mars is 38% the gravity of earth so it will require less thrust but that's definitely a big concern for me is how will the first starships land on mars you know how will that happen it obviously will disrupt the ground a lot you you probably won't i don't think they're going to land on mars using those auxiliary thrusters um that just doesn't really make sense for that architecture so i don't know uh it's it's a, it's a great great question i think that's something that i need to ask elon about when i interview him next and see if we can if they're trying to solve that or if that's one of those things that's kind of like we'll we'll solve it when we get there type of thing like literally <laughs> lose a couple vehicles for the first times until we come up with a solution but i don't know and as far as sls being dead uh don't forget they literally have basically 3 sls's built for the most part like most of the hardware for for 3 sls's is built um i expect to see for sure those 3 flying i think after <sighs> Especially once we run out of RS twenty fives, which is which will be Artemis four. Um, after that, I, I expect it to be hard. That could be where I could see the cutoff being where Congress or you know if the new administrator wants to cut off SLS, I could see them being like you know let's cut off and not do new RS twenty fives. We're going to stop at Artemis four, which would be four SLS flights. I could see. I mean, it, anything could happen at this point, especially with if there's big budget constraints now. You know, with with a economy that's kind of, you know, globally, a lot of people are struggling. Uh, it's probably smart to have some resources going um, in some other aids for some other areas uh, for the average person. Of course, it, you know, at the same time, if you cancel something like the SLS program, you are laying off at the same time, 50,000 people or something like that. So it does affect people, but you shouldn't, that shouldn't be a reason to continue a program just because you have to lay people off. You know, um, it should be competitive and it should be they, they should be, uh, you know, the, the program should be worth not canceling. And it's it, SLS to me is hard to justify. Um, Orion's expensive, but it's at least like done and really well certified and ready to go. Um, and it's really our only true option for deep space flight right now. So I don't know. Um, I don't know about the fate of SLS. I think the next 2021 will really be telling for SLS. If it doesn't make it through its first flight, uh, I think it's going to be in real, real, real trouble. But they don't forget, there are contracts and, and the things funded for 
quite a ways out still though with SLS. So they would have to backtrack on some of those because right now it's like actually funded through at least like eight. But yeah, great question. Uh, really loaded questions, but really good questions. Uh, pr- this is from Prove uh, Prude. Prude V, sorry. Uh, the GSLV Mark III, India's biggest launch coming next year. Yes, there's, there's. I, I need to do a video uh, about ISRO still. I, I absolutely know I need to do this. This is on my list. It might be a really upcoming one uh, that I just kind of give a rundown on like how India can make some of the most uh, impressive rockets at half the price, you know, because that seems to be about what it is. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, the, the, the GSLV vehicles in general are awesome and have been really, really impressive. Uh, Joseph Tatum says, Hey Tim, do you know, uh, what it looks like, uh, what that looks like stars and NASA's live feed from inside the ISS? I think I do. I'm pretty sure those are dead pixels because of high radiation. I'm pretty sure those are literally dead pixels in the sensor that have been like bombarded and, and broken up and are dead from radiation because a lot of those cameras do have that uh it makes sense if you're in a higher radiation environment um for years those cameras have been up there for years that they would grow dead pixels i'm pretty sure i i i mean i don't know i don't i have never actually heard that but i've thought of, i've seen the footage and i'm always like man that's a lot of dead pixels and i was like i bet it's because of radiation so um i don't know anyone anyone know anyone know the actual not just my speculation but i think that's a fair speculation but I don't know. Um, this is from Blucher. Or, uh, when will the next membership KSP stream? I'm probably going to have to do it here before the end of the month and, and definitely before I take off, either before I take off for Texas or once I get to Texas, depending on what the schedule looks like. But it'll be here at the end of the month um, in the next week or so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so stay tuned. If you are a member, if you are a patron, make sure you're, you're you know, have notifications on or something so you know when I, when I post. And, uh, and then you'll be able to join. This is from uh, Void. Hey, Everyday Astronaut, I'm uh, I'm in my depression state, and this really makes me kind of happy. Uh, thank you for your comment on this event. I love you, bro. Void, that's that's what spaceflight is for me. Spaceflight is is something that we can all cheer for. You know, it's it's the the one team we can all just like be excited about, right? Um, you know, I've never been someone that was too into sports. I mean, I played soccer. I I did cross country when I was in high school and stuff like that, but. I never really watched sports. They just didn't speak to me. It seemed it just seemed sort of frivolous or, or arbitrary, I guess. And I think that's what I, I love about spaceflight is there's a, a meaning, a purpose, a, a reason behind every single launch. You know that there's uh, a a deal, a certain deal of risk and reward. Uh, there's a lot of emotions in spaceflight, and it's just fun to be able to do it together, watch it together, have some hope. You know, we're watching human progress before our eyes, especially. To me, that's the thing for, for Boca Chica, why Boca Chica is so fun to watch the development of Starship is just because it is literally like you get a sense that you're looking at the future. You get a sense that you are watching stuff happen before our eyes, you know, and and it gives you a sense of hope. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that void because I'm, uh, I'm in the same boat as far as this stuff makes me happy. It brings joy to me. It brings hope. So, yeah, uh, keep keep tuning in. Keep learning. I feel like learning things and is one of the best ways, honestly, it, it gets your mind going and it helps you realize like it, we're really lucky to be here. We're really lucky to be in this time. We're really lucky to have access to this information. So uh, from Jonas, the Swiss games, uh, put Zurich or uh, Lusain or Lu- I, I don't know how to say it, both Switzerland on your list for that tour. Yes, I uh, I was. No, I didn't go to Switzerland at all last last November. I just went to Austria and Germany. Um, but yeah, I I love Switzerland. I actually really love the Tune area. That is like, whoo. I don't think that's a very populated area though. So it might not be the best place to do uh, part of a speaking tour. What I'll probably do is just look up and do the the biggest cities. And luckily with, it's Europe. So like at most, you know, if someone, if I, if I did eight cities in Europe, I'd probably be within like two hours of 95% of the population of Europe or something like that. So obviously, you know, I'll have to pick and choose, but, um, but yeah, the UK might need two spots though. We might need to do like a, a northern UK and a southern UK thing because there's a lot of people in the UK that are subscribed here. So, um, yeah. Uh, from from Steve Lewis. Um, okay, question answered. Lol. <laughs> Greeting from Qatar. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, sorry about 
<laughs> missing the payload deploy earlier. Richard uh, Ber- Bergeron says, um, hi, Tim. Great show. Question. Any insights if SpaceX are developing a full astronaut spacesuit designed to go on Mars? I don't know. I have not heard anything if they're working on a proper EVA suit, so an extravehicular activity suit on their own, or if they'll probably just use NASA's design or what. Uh, I can see Elon wanting his own. I wouldn't be surprised if he's working on a proper EVA suit for those purposes. Um, yeah, because don't forget the, the dragon, the, the suit that they wear in the dragon capsule, that is an IVA suit, an intravehicular activity suit. It's only there if there would be depressurization of the spacecraft or something in an emergency. But um, yeah, from uh, from Jesse O, uh, passed on your rant. Thanks for the great steam, stream. <laughs> well, let me know how it goes, Jesse. I'm very curious. I feel like it's really hard to convince someone of something they're already convinced of, like convince them otherwise. Um, so I understand if what I said was just a bunch of lunatic ramblings to your grandpa, but maybe, maybe something clicked, you know, who knows? Um, there's, that's a lot of 400,000 people. That's a lot of people to have lying. Uh, you know, there's actually a, there's an equation. There's an approximate, uh, for conspiracy theories, you know, the longer, the larger it is, the more complex it is, obviously the more risk there is of people coming out and whistleblowing. Right. Um, and that happens, you know, we actually have, there's a a statistical, uh, equation basically for that saying like it's uh, you know if there's a thousand people involved it likely will be this long before silence is broken on it or whatever so having 400,000 people many of whom have already passed uh, hold, taking that to their grave is quite a big that's a huge accomplishment <laughs> statistically impossible um, yeah Steve Radio uh, for the Mars Fund as a way of apology for being late on parade <laughs> hey Again, I'm not going to Mars. You're not getting me to go to Mars. But <laughs> thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Henry, favorite KSP moon or planet? Also, do you think uh, tri-propellant rockets will ever be feasible? They're definitely feasible. Are they beneficial? Are they worth using? You know, um, there's there's been tri-propellant rockets for for a long time. Uh, different hybrids, I, and that's one of those things. Even I was reading uh, about an engine in the Soviet Union. I don't think it's making it into the, the video, but it was a, it was a tri-propellant rocket. Um, yeah, I I just don't see a, a need. Like, I, I don't see a, a clear benefit. In fact, you, you know, if you have to add tanks, that's normally a bad thing. You, you know, at at best, you, you're only adding the weight of an extra bulkhead to separate fluids. But sometimes you might have, to have different insulation considerations, having a different, you know, fuel on there. So, yeah. Um, but as far as my favorite KSP moon or planet, I love EVE. I'm obsessed with EVE. I'm obsessed with trying to get off of EVE. I've been working on a reusability plane in uh in discord or you know with our on our patreon feeds uh when i when i have time to play ksp i'm i'm working on getting off of eve with a reusable vehicle uh that's my favorite by far it's so challenging it's just fun 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 physics it's almost like earth 2.0 it's it's harder to get off of than earth kind of actually no it's not really harder to get off of real earth it's way harder to get off of than carbon it's kind of like a good mix but yeah um is california the only place uh, with with rocket launch tax, I don't know. I have no idea. That's well beyond. I don't know. That's really interesting. That's really really interesting. Um, and this is from um, from D uh, D S D Sing F S W. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your tip. Um, so yeah, so like I said, guys, if you are a Patreon supporter or a YouTube member, get ready. I'll probably have to find a time to to do a, a an exclusive stream. I don't know when I'll squeeze that in. It might have to be once I'm in Texas, but I'll try to get it done before the end of the month. That's what we should try to do. Um, yeah, if and if those of you that want to help support what I do, uh, remember to head on over to shop.everydayastronaut.com. Uh, today, like I said, we do have 15% off of the uh, the pointy end up flaming and down shirt that I'm wearing. If you use coupon code launch day, check out the awesome shirt. Um, coupon code launch day, all one word, all lowercase. Check that out. Um, yeah, and like I said, we have some new stuff. Although next week we will probably have some some more sales and we will have a few more new merchandise items. So a uh, little pro tip, maybe wait until next week, but uh, just get your, your gears turned in here and, and maybe get ready to show some friends or family members uh, if things to put on your your wish list this year if if you want to help support what i do um or just express your love of nerdy space flight stuff uh yeah so i'm gonna go back to charting and finishing up that soviet rocket video we did a, a read through yesterday with some of the um 
with our our commanders in Discord last night. We did a read through of some of the changes to the script. It is a beefy, beefy script. Get ready for this. This is going to be. I, it has to be good because it's it's a one time shot here when you're when you're dealing with with history. So, oh man. Oh, here we go. One more here from from Beamer Geezer. If Mount Everest could be detached from the ground, how many Raptor engines would it take to launch it? Oh God, why? How heavy? Okay. <laughs> it's 357, tr 357 trillion pounds. So we can just divide that by, um, what is the, uh, how many pounds is the, the Raptor engine? Three, what did I say? 357, 355. Um, that's the hundred, that's thousands, million, billion, trillion. And Raptor, I mean, it's 200 tons, but I'm making sure I have that in pounds correctly. Raptor engine thrust, um, 500,000 pounds. So basically we can divide that by 500,000. Uh, it would take, oh, one, two, three. Why aren't there commas in this stuff? 714 million Raptor engines to lift Mount Everest, and this, that's without uh, without fuel to run them. So it takes 714. They have to be plump, like piped into the ground. You need like, sorry, you need you need 714 million and one if you want your thrust to weight ratio to be above. You know, you have to have if you actually want to have it go up. You could hover with 314 million. Uh, yeah. So yeah, th that's that's about that. <laughs> that's that's the best I can do. Um, and this is for musical wolves. One more here. Make a not going to Mars hat. Maybe for myself. I don't know if people need that in their lives other than me. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Congrats, of course, to SpaceX and NASA on and ESA on a beautiful launch day. That was absolutely gorgeous. One of my favorites of the year, actually. Uh, really, really cool to see. Congrats to all the teams out there. And thank you guys for tuning in and listening with me, watching with me, learning with me. Uh, I really appreciate you guys all being here. So yeah, cheers, everybody. Have a fantastic weekend. I think tomorrow we have another launch already, a Starlink launch. So you'll see me again tomorrow. Don't get sick of my face too much. And uh, yeah, I'm heading out. All right, everybody. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Goodbye, everybody.